Hi, and welcome back. In this video, I will be showing how to host a globally accessible website from your computer at home. As a bonus, this process is completely free. The first question you may have is, why go through the extra trouble with this when you can find free hosting services pretty easily? To that, I would say it's a matter of flexibility. With free hosting services, they usually have certain languages, databases, or servers that they support and you have to choose from the options they provide. In addition, there's usually limits on the amount of storage or bandwidth these businesses allow. Above those, you'd have to start paying. With the method I will be showing, you can choose to use any web technology you want, limited only by your ambition and skill level. As for storage and bandwidth, the limit would be your own hardware and any limits placed by your ISP or internet service provider. Typically, ISPs don't really have limits that would hinder hosting your own website at home, provided that it doesn't receive crazy amounts of traffic. To get started, I think it's helpful to show a bird's eye view of how the internet works and then go into each component that we need in more detail. Abstractly, the internet is all about sharing data. You have some data you wish to provide, someone out there has a desire to access this data. With the internet, your data is on a computer, and the user is also going to access the data from his or her computer. These two computers are connected via a router and modem. But how does the user find the data on your computer? First, the user needs to find your computer from the millions of other computers also connected to the internet. On the internet, each computer has a unique address, called an IP address. With this address, users have direct access to a computer. There are a few problems with trying to provide this IP address directly to users. First, these IP addresses are assigned by your ISP. While they are unique to every computer, they aren't necessarily permanent. They can change at any time. Also, these IP addresses aren't very readable and are hard to remember. Thus, we have domain names, which are the readable names of websites that everyone can easily remember such as google.com, youtube.com, or wikipedia.org, just to name a few. To connect the domain names to the IP addresses, we have name servers. These are places where users provide a domain name to look up the corresponding IP address. So with that, the way that the data flows is usually like this. A user will do a Google search for the data that he or she is looking for. Google will provide your domain name to the user. The user then puts your domain name into the address box and sends a request. This request goes to a name server which will then find your IP address, which will then find your computer. Now having found your computer, the user still needs to find the data he or she is looking for. For websites, you would host a web server on your computer, which is listening on a certain port. When the user finds your computer, this request will come in through the port the web server is listening on. The web server will process the request and send it to the appropriate web application, which will then send back the data that the user is looking for. Now, in order for this to happen, there is a few things we need to do. We need a way to tell the world that this domain belongs to us and should be associated with our IP address. We need to set up our router to allow web traffic in. We need to set up a web server and configure it on our computer. And finally, we need to create a web application that will be running on our computer. To tell the world about our domain and IP address, there's two sides to this. We need to register for a service that will provide us with a free host name on their domain, and we need to update our router to periodically send the service with updates to our IP address. For the service, I had been using no IP for more than five years. Before that, I had used Dyn DNS until they got bought by Oracle. There are a few others also available, and I'll provide links to them in the description. With no IP, the only thing I have to do after setting things up is to confirm that the host name is still being used by clicking on a link in an email they send every 30 days. So we create an account and select a host name we would like to use. Once that's set up, we go into the host name and set the IP to the IP address from our computer that will be hosting the data. Now we need to set up our router to periodically send IP address updates to no IP. These instructions may be different for you depending on the router brand and model you have. In my demonstration, I am using an ASUS router. 
If your router doesn't have this functionality, you can also periodically run a script from your computer that will do the same thing. However, as my router supports this functionality out of the box, that's the method I will be showing. I can access my router from within Chrome. For me, this is by typing 192.168.55.111 in the address bar in Chrome and pressing enter. This may be different for you. Typically, it is 192.168.1.1. After logging in, I go to the WAN section on the left side navigation menu and click on the DDNS tab. Here is where I select the server, which is the dynamic DNS service provider, no IP in my case. I also put in my credentials. I make sure that the DDNS client is set to enable and I click apply. Since we're in the router settings, now is a good time to allow web traffic in. We do this through port forwarding. This will connect traffic coming into the router from a certain port to a corresponding port on a computer connected to the router. This is how the router is able to direct traffic to the specific computer in your network containing the data you want to share. First, we need to go to the LAN section from the left side navigation menu, and then go into the DHCP server tab. I add a manually assigned IP for the server, which I select from the drop-down appliance. This tells the router to give the same IP address to the server whenever the server is connected. I click apply to save the settings. Now I go back to the WAN section and I go into the virtual server port forwarding tab. Here I enable port forwarding and I add two rules. Port 80 is for HTTP traffic and port 443 is for HTTPS traffic. For the local IP, I specify the server from the dropdown of connected devices. I click apply to save the settings. For most internet service providers, this should be enough. However, my ISP AT&T connects using a modem that has a router built in. Therefore, I am connecting my router to what is effectively another router. I need to configure the AT&T modem slash router to play nice with my router. So this next part is specific to AT&T home internet customers. From within my router, I go back into the LAN section using the left side navigation menu. I go to the LAN IP tab. I set the IP address to 192.168.55.111. What's important is that 55 needs to be different from the settings in the AT&T modem slash router, which I'll show later. I click apply to save the settings. Next, I go to the DHCP server tab and make sure the starting address and ending address also have the 55 in them. I also make sure the manually set IP also have this 55. I make changes if needed and click apply. It may be good to double check the port forwarding settings to see whether the manually set IP also made it there. Now I go into the network map section from the left side navigation menu and take note of the LAN MAC address. This is the MAC address of the router and we will need it later. Now I go into the AT&T modem slash router by typing 192.168.1.254 into the address bar in Chrome and press enter. I click on the Home Network tab and Subnets and DHCP sub tab, and I'm prompted with a login screen. I need to provide the access code that is on a sticker affixed to the side of the AT&T modem slash router. After entering the access code, I make sure that the DHCP server is set to enabled and that the IP addresses all have a different third number. In my case, it is one. Next, I click on the Firewall tab and the IP Passroute sub tab. I set the allocation mode to pass-through and pass-through mode to DHCPS fixed and select the router's MAC address from the drop-down list of devices. It's here that it's important to have noted the router's MAC address from earlier. I click save to save the settings. Now I click on the NAT slash gaming sub tab still within the firewall tab and add two rules for forwarding the ports for HTTP and HTTPS traffic. This is similar to what I did for my router earlier. This concludes all the settings needed to allow incoming web traffic and direct them to the server. Now we get to the fun part. So the web traffic is able to get to the server, but it's stuck there unless there's a web server waiting to handle incoming requests. There's a number of web servers out there, such as Apache, N Nginx, 
or Tomcat. There is a lot of choices out there, but for the purpose of demonstration, I just want to set something up real fast. I'm going to go with Ruby on Rails, which is a web application framework that comes with a built-in web server. So I follow the guide linked in the description and get an application set up quickly. Now I just come into the default home page and put in a customized touch. Now I start up the server. I access my host name using my mobile device and see that the page comes up. Next time you're outside, you can try accessing this host name and see that it comes up. If you're having trouble, there's a few things to look at. First, if you are using an AT&T modem slash router, go to the firewall tab and the firewall advanced sub tab and check that the settings are like this. Finally, you can log into your account with your dynamic DNS provider and check that your correct IP is being displayed for your host name. All right, this just about wraps everything up. I understand that what I am demonstrating in this video is very specific to my setup. So please keep in mind that you will need to be flexible and adapt these instructions to your own setup. However, I think that the result is well worth the effort. With this, you are able to share anything you want with the world. Thanks for watching.